I wanted to be I wanted to be I wanted first. to be the first kid on my block. I'm living like there's no tomorrow. To get a confirmed kill. How'd you like how'd you like to have a little fun? What do we get for ten dollars? Everything you want. Thanks for watching my analysis and reviews of Matthew Weiner's 2007 American period drama series Mad Men. Smoke gets in your eyes. Stanley Kubrick's 1987 war drama Full Metal Jacket and his 1999 thriller Eyes Wide Shut Mad Men. Smoke gets in your eyes is written by Matthew Weiner and directed by Alan Taylor. Full Metal Jacket is written by Stanley Kubrick, Michael Herr, and Gustav Hasford, and directed by Stanley Kubrick, as is Eyes Wide Shut, which he co-wrote with Frederick Raphael. If you are new to the channel, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to The Godfather of Cinema, movie reviews, and more. Give this video a thumbs up, hit the bell, leave a comment, and a small donation if you like this video and would like to help me to do more like it in the future. Galatians, Galatians chapter, chapter 5, 5 and verse 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. We are all prisoners of the flesh from birth, our family, schools, jobs, courts, laws, religion, and other institutions. Teach us that lying, stealing, killing, gluttony, fornication, revenge, jealousy, hatred, laziness, and violence are all bad, and yet we cannot resist them. Why? Because evil is instinctive and natural to us, and most importantly, evil feels good to us. What do we get for $10? Everything you want. In this analysis of Mad Men, Full Metal Jacket and Eyes Wide Shut, I will explain how we have become experts at appearing civilized when in fact we are inclined to follow our urges and appetites and only free when we are allowed to indulge them privately with consent and under the right conditions. I'm living like there's no tomorrow because there isn't one. Slavery, eugenics, and sexism, things that used to be right are now wrong. While things that used to be wrong, like smoking weed and sore losers, the love in the air, I've never seen anything like it, are now right. So, if all it takes is consent to make something bad good and vice versa, what would we not do if we had the freedom to do anything we wanted to? In Stanley Kubrick's 1987 film, Full Metal Jacket, soldiers in Vietnam enjoy the freedom to do things that they cannot do in America, such as Sergeant J.T. Davis, nicknamed Joker. Only after you eat the peanuts out of my... And his cameraman named Rafter Man. Mother Green and her killing machine. Negotiating with a hooker in broad daylight in a public place. Me love you long time. As an entire squad called the Lust Hogs fighting over a hooker like dogs over a bone in broad daylight. Red, don't get between the dog and his meat. And as the door gunner on a military helicopter bragging about the fact that he has killed many VCs and civilians, women, children, and 50 water buffaloes. Ain't war hell! All legally at a mass grave, a Marine Colonel Grill Sergeant Joker for having born to kill on his helmet and a peace button on his body armor. Trying to suggest something about the duality of man, sir. The contradictions of war and peace, total freedom and restrictions, beasts and men, Vietnam and America, that men are allowed to do almost anything in one place and are not allowed to do those same things in another place. That something wrong in one place can be right in another place. Because right and wrong have nothing to do with morality and everything to do with location, location, location. Because you can do things in a strip club that you cannot 
do outside of a strip club. Men and women are only good when they are forced to be good. The soldiers in Vietnam and this film are free to do what feels natural and good to them without getting in trouble for doing the exact same thing in America. Don't you want to go where the rainbow ends? And speaking of mad men, Bill Harford in Stanley Kubrick's 1999 film Eyes Wide Shut wants his wife to believe that he is a man of superior discipline incapable of being seduced by beautiful women as a doctor until Alice tells him the truth about herself. At Cape Cod last summer, there was a naval officer there sitting near their table at a restaurant and she fell fantasized about him and would have left Bill and their child to be with him if he had asked her to. And this is a shock to Bill as it never occurred to him that she could feel anything for any other man because she is his wife. They have a child together and he loves her. This same night, Bill gets a call to go see a woman whose father has passed away and he leaves Alice to go there to console Marion. I came as soon as I got the message. There, the beautiful woman breaks down and begs him to make her his mistress. <laughs> Bill is tempted until her fiancé stops by to console her on her father's death. Carl spoils the mood for Bill. Damn it who now feels sorrier for Carl than he does for Marion because Carl does not know that his grieving soon-to-be wife is a slut and this makes Bill think twice about his wife, Alice, and the officer at Cape Cod. So he leaves them and runs into a beautiful young hooker named Domino. How'd you like to have a little fun? Who invites him into her apartment. But before they can get into anything raunchy, his phone rings and it is Alice. He has been gone for a long time and she was calling to see if he's okay. He is comforting. The dead man's grieving daughter is his life. <laughs> And he is too ashamed to pick up where he left off with Domino, so he leaves her as he left Marion <laughs> after being interrupted by Carl. Damn it. Again, the thought of Alice and the naval officer flashes through Bill's mind and he somehow winds up at Cafe Sonata where an old friend there is playing the piano. Nick Nightingale also has a side gig playing at masquerade balls and one time the blindfold they made him wear was loose enough for him to see lots of beautiful naked women. And hearing this, Bill's eyes light up up at the notion of attending a masquerade ball and having sex with beautiful naked women without putting his marriage respectability as a doctor and role as a father at risk. The temptation is too great to resist, for unlike Alice, who is honest about her fantasies and weaknesses, hiding behind a mask is an ideal front for Bill to protect his statuses and maintain the lie that he is incapable of adultery because he is a doctor. Alice's husband and the father of her child that he cannot cheat on Alice as she would have cheated on him with the naval officer at Cape Cod if she had had the opportunity to do so as he would have screwed those two beautiful women at the Christmas party if Victor Ziegler's butler had not stopped him from doing so. Don't you want to go where the rainbow ends? As he would have also screwed Domino. I'm in your hands the prostitute if Alice had not called and stopped him from doing so. Fooling around with Marion as himself would have been wrong. Having sex with Domino as himself would have also been wrong. But screwing beautiful women who do not know him, his name, or how he looks is right. <laughs> 
because he could do so in a place in which adultery is condoned at a masquerade ball at night. Which brings us to Mad Men and creative director Don Draper, who is not the man everyone thinks he is. Richard Whitman is his real name and he is married to a traditional pre-1960s housewife named Betty. However, his mistress is not like his wife at all. Midge Daniels is single, lives alone, and owns her own business. She has no plans to get married or to be a mom. There's 120 cash. Man Midge, unlike his wife, speaks her mind when Don entertains the idea of them getting married. She is blunt and straight to the point. She doesn't believe in making plans and she won't make his breakfast. Midge will not be his traditional pre-1960s housewife, and neither will Rachel Mencken. I'm not interested in housewives. Like Midge, she owns a business and does not buy into the notion that a woman can only be happy if she is married with children. To the contrary, she is very happy running her father's department store. And also, like Midge, and unlike his stay-at-home wife, Betty, Rachel Minkin speaks her mind when Don implies that her store should offer coupons. So I suppose what I think matters most right now. Because he does not believe that people will pay full price at a Jewish department store as they will at a non-Jewish department store. I want your kind of people. People, Mr. Draper. Rachel rejects Don's suggestion to offer coupons to her customers and this pisses him off and he storms out of this meeting not because she rejected his suggestion but because a woman had talked back to him and Don is used to women staying in their place. I'm not gonna let a woman talk to me like this. In short, Don Draper is a contradiction in that he is also attracted to Rachel Mencken because she does not know her place. For instance, he will make a joke about the lack of Jewish people employed at Sterling Cooper one minute. You want me to run down to the deli and grab somebody? And then tell Rachel that her store isn't good enough to charge full price like other department stores because she is a Jewish woman the next minute. Honestly, coupon? But away from his peers at Sterling Cooper, Don Draper sees independent women like Rachel Macon, regardless of ethnicity, differently after inviting her out to a bar to make up for the meeting he walked out of after she rejected his suggestion. He flirts with her because he is attracted to her as he is to Midge. Daniels. There's 120 in cash. Because when all is said and done, he is a man and she is a woman, even though the times have not changed yet for him to be so openly, Don Draper is attracted to Rachel Mencken, a Jew, secretly. Like Don Draper, account executive Pete Campbell is a chauvinist. You pull your waist in a little bit, you might look like a woman. With a narrow view of women, and when he sees Peggy Olsen, the new girl, he sees an opportunity for a Sex. So do I get first crack at her? It's like done. Pete conforms to the norms and the prototype of the woman that society says he is supposed to marry, settle down, and have a child with. For instance, he is marrying a nice girl. But at the same time, he really wants a woman like Peggy Olsen, though not to marry, but to fool around with a bad girl. Come up sometimes, see me. At Pete Campbell's bachelor party at the Slipper Room, he and his colleagues are free to do almost anything that they want to do in a society of laws forcing them to pretend to be gentlemen and wear ties. Here, they are allowed to loosen their ties, relax, and be themselves. Their inhibitions are lubricated by alcohol loud music, vulgar language, and a woman up on a stage stripping out of her clothes. And Pete Campbell is sitting with Wanda and she becomes his target. Ken met her at an auto mat and invited her to the bachelor party. And like the stripper, Pete reveals more and more of himself to Wanda. 
until she gets up to sit on the other side of the table because there are boundaries, even in a strip club. So he leaves and stops by an apartment to see Peggy Olsen. I'm getting married on Sunday. I heard that. He should have gone home to his soon-to-be wife, but not tonight because she is a nice girl and tonight he needs the freedom to do things he could not do with her. A bad girl. People won't talk to the police when they can leave an anonymous tip. Cowards won't insult you to your face when they can do so on a computer. And a hypocrite like Bill Harford will not cheat on his wife, but he can do so at a masquerade ball, as in Full Metal Jacket and Mad Men. Bill is two people, a husband, a doctor, and a father in one place, and a freak and a hypocrite in another place, in one place. Bill is what he is trained to be, and in the other place, he is what he is naturally. I'm living like there's no tomorrow because there isn't one. Did you know that Stanley Kubrick died just six days after showing the final cut of Eyes Wide Shut to Warner Brothers executives? Also, that out of all of the films he made up to that time, he called Eyes Wide Shut his greatest contribution to the art of cinema. Did you know that Kubrick initially considered making Eyes Wide Shut a sex comedy and casting either Steve Martin or Woody Allen in the main role? Did you know that Kubrick had a fear of flying and shot eyes wide shut entirely in England, including the Greenwich Village scene. He sent workmen to Manhattan to measure the streets in order to make the scene look authentic. Did you know that R. Lee Ermey, who plays Gunnery Sergeant Hartman in Kubrick's 1987 war film Full Metal Jacket, said that Kubrick phoned him two weeks before his death and told him that he thought that Eyes Wide Shut was a piece of and that Kidman and Cruz, the film's main actors, had had their way with him, but this claim was disputed by Kubrick's daughter, Katharina, who said that her father was very proud of the film. Did you know that Mad Men won 16 Emmys and 5 Golden Globes over its 7 year run on AMC? Also, did you know that Mad Men is regarded by many as one of the greatest television series of all time? Did you know that Matthew Weiner, the creator and chief writer of Mad Men, cited Alfred Hitchcock as a major influence of the style of the series, particularly Hitchcock's films Vertigo and North by Northwest? Did you know that Rolling Stone magazine called Mad Men the greatest TV drama of all time? Did you know that Full Metal Jacket was made with a budget of only $16 million, the film went on to gross $120 million. Did you know that R. Lee Ermey was not Stanley Kubrick's initial choice to play Gunnery Sergeant Hartman? Ermey previously portrayed a drill instructor in the Boys and Company C in 1978. After seeing Ermey's performance in that film, Kubrick did not believe that Ermey was vicious enough to play Gunnery Sergeant Hartman. However, after seeing a tape of of Ermey insulting a group of Royal Marines. Kubrick was so impressed by Ermey and his way of breaking down the individuality of the new recruits that he gave Ermey the part. Did you know that actors Val Kilmer and Anthony Michael Hall were considered for the role of Joker, which eventually went to actor Matthew Modine? So again, thanks for watching. Let me know what you think of my analysis in the comments below and be sure to subscribe to The Godfather of Cinema movie reviews and more. Until next time.